welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I am Kanishka Gupta. Let's have a look at the stories for the day. India is set to overtake China to become the most populous country in the world by the middle of 2023. This is what the latest report released by the United Nations Population Fund has to say. And with close to 50% of its population below the age of 25, India has a time-bound opportunity to benefit from the demographic dividend. But if India doesn't play its cards right, the youth bulge could also turn into a demographic challenge. So which direction are India's socio-economic indicators pointing to? Dividend or disaster? And what can India do to ensure that it is the former? Pastor Kumar brings you the answers. From India's crowded trains to bumper-to-bumper -bumper road traffic, from its streets often being littered with trash to the poor state of its hospitals and schools, it has often been in fashion to blame all these ills on the size of its population. Going by this logic, alarm bells should ideally be ringing with the latest UN Population Fund report saying that India is set to become the most populous country in the world with 1.429 billion people by the middle of 2023, surpassing China at 1.426 billion. But a growing population can be a boon too. That is why Following the report, a UN representative also highlighted that with close to 50% of its population below the age of 25, India has a time-bound opportunity to benefit from the demographic dividend. How come? As the representative explained, India was witnessing a demographic transition as a youthful nation. A country stands to reap large economic benefits when the share of the working age population made up by the people between the ages of 15 to 64 is larger than the non-working age share. This is popularly known as a demographic dividend. But the National Family Health Survey released in 2021 showed that India's total fertility rate had declined from 2.2 in 2015 to 16 to 2.0 in 2019 to 21, which is below the replacement level. This means India's population is set to eventually fall. As such, experts agree that India's demographic dividend will last for another two decades and maybe even for a third. And India should cash in on it sooner rather than later. India's success in that will depend upon its working age population having good health, quality education, decent employment and a lower proportion of young dependents. With the advent of artificial intelligence and automation, resilience to technological disruption can also be added to the list. So, let us take a look at where India is placed. The latest National Family Health Survey also revealed that 67% of children under 5 and 59% of girls in the age group of 15 to 19 were anemic. Meanwhile, experts have said that the rise in health expenditure in budget 2023-24 was not enough to keep up with inflation. According to the National Health Policy 2017, the health budget is targeted at 2.5% of GDP by 2025. But Experts have said that India is a long way from reaching that target. At the moment, India's investment in health is about 1.2%. Even if you accept that expenditure on nutrition, water, air pollution, all of these also contribute to health, even then it doesn't really go up beyond 1.5%. And what we really require is a jump in health expenditure as a percentage of GDP to at least 2.5% and that too well spent in terms of the priorities and then we can get the required dividend. What about skilling? In 2021-22, to the government's flagship skills mission scheme was only able to get a fifth of its trainees placed in a job against a target of 70%. Meanwhile, the latest multiple indicator survey report revealed that barely 27% of respondents in the 15 to 29 age group 
said they knew how to send an email with attachments and only 9% could create a presentation using software. The biggest thing that needs to be done for blue collar workers is they need to be trained in basic digital skill. Apart from these technical digital skills, I think soft skills, because they need increased collaboration with the kind of jobs that are now going to come up. They're no longer going to be simple assembly workers standing in a line, assembling things and moving things forward. According to the annual status of education report 2022, while student enrollments have increased to more than pre-pandemic level, the basic reading ability of school students across all classes has dropped to pre-2012 level and basic math skills have declined to 2018 level. Moving from education to jobs, to absorb new workers and those shifting from farm work, India needs to generate close to 12 million additional non-farm jobs every year between 2023 and 2030. This would triple the number created annually between 2012 and 2018. Clearly, an intervention is called for. But despite all the promises in the new education policy of taking education expenditures a proportion to GDP to 6%, we are actually at 2.9%. Our goal has not to be achieving a $5 trillion economy, but rather that we add a minimum of 10 to 12 million non-farm jobs every year. So we pull workers out of agriculture that raises real wages in agriculture and people are that raises aggregate demand. How are we going to raise non-farm jobs? Well, clearly PLI is not going to do it. In any case, it's only in, it's ma mainly in capital intensive sectors. So the focus needs to be uh, on MSMEs. India is more likely to face a demographic challenge than reap a dividend unless a whole of government approach is adopted towards education, health, nutrition, skills that match the needs of the time and greatly accelerated job creation. Health of its citizens is indeed the most essential factor without which growth of any country cannot be ensured. Staying with the theme, health drink Bon Vita was at the centre of a row recently when a social media influencer alleged that its daily consumption could be harmful. While the post was taken down later, it ignited a debate around health foods. Tariq Ahmed report has more on it. Ravant Himatsinka, an Instagram influencer, went viral across social media platforms recently with a short video on popular malt-based hot drink Bon Vita. In his video, Himatsinka highlighted the excessive amount of sugar content in Bon Vita and its colouring material that is carcinogenic in nature. The influencer pointed out that continued consumption of it can lead to non-communicable diseases like diabetes and obesity. However, upon receiving a legal notice, he took down the video with a public letter requesting the multinational to avoid any legal procedure. Bonvita came up with a clarification that a single serve of Bonvita contains 7.5 grams of sugar and it is below the daily limit that children can take. They recommend mixing it in 200 ml of hot or cold milk. But the problem lies in marketing of products which are high in sugar, salt and fat content as healthy food or drink. Also, there is no clear guideline by the manufacturer on how much of the product can be consumed in a single serve. Ashim Sanyal, the Chief Operating Officer at Consumer Voice, says food products that are marketed as healthy are different from supplementary medicines prescribed by a doctor. This given the situation, the company will get away with this because of the loose laws that we have. But the concern basically is that can they be called a health drink is something that we need to address uh, overriding all other factors. Now, most of the health drinks are meant for children and elderly people. Uh, we all know that uh, normally the younger generation and the normal adults do not take the health drink. So, so therefore, 
you introduce a health drink for your children or for adults uh, above a certain age, let's say 60 plus. Uh, both the section, that is the children and the adults, do not need more sugar levels at what we call as hollow sugar, which is something that is mentioned there as sugar per se, because that gives you empty calories, that gives you something which is, which is harmful to your body, gives you instant energy, but then it doesn't give you any other benefit. While such food products are deeply rooted in Indian households, research shows that most of them have excessive amount of sugar, salt or fat. A research paper analyzing 48 heavily marketed pre-packaged food products in India found all of them contained excessive presence of at least one concerning nutrients. Such food products, experts mentioned, are targeted and consumed by the children from a very early age. Pediatrician Dr. Vandana Prasad agrees that a lot of these food products are addictive in nature and the fact that they are being fed from a young age makes them more problematic. After that, of course, companies play on the naivety of the general public to, um, uh, to basically uh, sell and to, to uh, make their profits. And, you know, one very hard hitting example of this and how naive the Indian market is that the same products that um, people have become clever about in, say, Western countries. Uh, the, the very same product sold in our country, the same bottle of beverage or the same packet of a pre-packaged uh, you know, snack, for instance, would have higher levels of sugar, salt and fat in India than they would in another country where there's better regulation. You know, So it just goes to show that Companies are banking on uh, the naivety of the Indian market as well as the, the uh, laxity of the regulatory system. In India, there seems to be a lack of clarity regarding regulations on how packaged foods are marketed. Two laws can be you know, utilized to regulate uh, misleading advertisements and they have to be seen actually together. One of them is the Food uh, Standards and Safety Act. Uh, and the other, which says that no no product shall use misleading or shall provide misleading information. But unfortunately, this act doesn't, um, it doesn't detail what misleading means. It doesn't actually define legally what misleading means. And to do that, we have to go into a subsequent act, that, that's the Consumer Protection Act, which then starts to define misleading in some sense. But they're quite easy to get away with. A debate around implementing front of packet labeling or FOPL is going on in the country today. If a product contains excessive amounts of added sugar, salt or fat, the FOPL is mandated to mention the same on the front of the pack in a clear manner. Since there is evidence suggesting the use of excessive salt, sugar and fat over a period of time results in non-communicable and cardiovascular diseases, India today is in dire need of clear laws regarding the marketing and advertisements of such products, especially when they are being marketed as healthy food. Moving on, though fear of higher interest rates triggered Bitcoin to break below 30,000 US dollars in the recent days. So far this year, the crypto asset has surged over 70%, beating equity market returns as well as gold. So what is driving investors towards this riskier asset? And will this uptrend sustain in the near term? Lavisha Darat brings you a detailed report. After a sharp sell-off last year, investors have turned warm towards cryptocurrencies in 2023, overpowering other asset classes like equities and commodities. On a year-to-date basis, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Binance Coin and Solana have delivered returns in the range of 62 to 124%. Meanwhile, equities, crude oil and precious metals like gold and silver have shaped up to 9% returns during the same period. So what makes Bitcoin the best performing asset class in these uncertain times? The collapse of the three U.S. banks, particularly the Silicon Valley Bank and the Swiss bank Credit Suisse, triggered fears of banking contagion in early March this year. The stock markets also reacted negatively, sharply, though briefly. Uh, this caused a flight to safety. 
gold rose to about two thousand dollars a troy ounce. Investors also started bottom fishing in cryptocurrencies, which had crashed last year. Consequently, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum skyrocketed by more than seventy percentage year till date. However, analysts also remain cautious and suggest investors to not jump in the crypto bandwagon as the rally could be short-lived amid regulatory concerns. Vijay Kumar of Geojit Financial Services, for instance, believes that easing banking fears will reduce volatile market conditions in near term, thereby making crypto investments unattractive from here on. There is no fear in the market now. The best best indicator of the absence of fear. Is the decline in CBOE VIX, the volatility index, from 27 in mid March to around 17 now? Therefore, the run up in safe haven asset like gold is unlikely to sustain. Cryptocurrencies have always been highly volatile and unpredictable. But they also uh, are unlikely to sustain the uptrend of the past uh, few weeks. Minal Thakur of Coin DCX2 remains bullish for crypto assets in the near term, but expects the rally to fizzle out by the end of the year. Here's why: There are three important things to consider. One is your entire global economic situation, where you have uh banking fears you have fed is still printing money you have interest rates still rising which makes all your fiat currencies inflationary and i think that is the time bitcoin was born for and hence in the short term we have been seeing a sort of a crypto bull run where prices have gone up more than 80 85% over the last few months um second is your bitcoin halving scheduled to be in about a year where your bitcoin mining rewards will be half of what it is today which will make bitcoin deinflationary as we move forward and third is your entire migration of ethereum from proof of work to proof of stake uh, and with the recent appeal upgrade now it you can stake on ethereum without any lock in periods and earn interest rate which will in the long run enable more deposits on ethereum chain and hence make ethereum deinflationary as well so I think in the in the in the short term, I think the prices will continue to rise. Um, though during the end of the year, as we have typically seen closer to Bitcoin halving, there might be some selling pressure and we might see some correction. I am super positive about uh, the price outlook for the next year and the years to come before beyond that. In conclusion, while crypto rally may have some steam left in the near term, the medium to long term outlook remains uncertain amid macro headwinds. Today, markets will react to Reliance Industries and ICICI Bank's Q4 results. Global queues, foreign flow action, and crude oil prices will continue to dominate investor sentiment. Russian crude oil exports meanwhile are back above the levels seen before its Ukraine invasion. Moving on, the world is staring at yet another crisis, this time in Africa. Sudan's capital Khartoum is in the grip of a fierce fighting between military and the paramilitary forces. Hundreds are reported killed and thousands have fled the capital. Several Indians too are stuck there. In our next segment, Raghav Agarwal tells more about the situation in Sudan. Over 4000 Indians are reportedly stuck in crisis hit Sudan right now and a large number of them are in its capital Khartoum which has turned into a war zone. Prime Minister Narendra Modi chaired a high level meeting on Friday to take stock of the condition of Indians trapped in Sudan. External Affairs Minister S Jay Shankar II has reportedly discussed the situation with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres last week. Ground reports suggest that residents have been attempting to flee to other parts of the country as the capital city Khartoum is now facing shortages of food and other supplies. 
According to WHO, over 300 people were killed last week, and several believe the actual toll can be much higher. The origins of the current turmoil can be traced back to December 19, 2018, when people in Sudan came out on the streets to protest against the country's long-serving president, Omar al-Bashir. They launched civil disobedience to demand better living conditions and freedom from his autocratic rule. In August and September 2019, the military generals in the country removed al-Bashir from power. They agreed to share power with civilians. A transitional sovereignty council was appointed and Abdullah Hamdok became the civilian prime minister of the country. But on October 25, 2021, the country's transition towards democracy halted abruptly after Sudanese military general Abdul Fattah al-Burhan launched a military coup and took control of the government. Hamdok refused to support al-Burhan and was put under house arrest on October 26. Since then, Sudan has been ruled by a sovereign council headed by al-Burhan. He drew support from a paramilitary group called the Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, led by General Mohammad Hamdan Dagalo, who was the vice president of the council. But now RSK and Sudan's military have turned against each other. The sovereign council, led by Al-Burhan, supports the transfer of power to civilians. They had promised to conduct the elections in the country by the end of 2023. However, both Al-Burhan and the Galo seem reluctant to give up power. Al-Burhan wants the RSF to integrate with the regular army within two years. Nagalo, on the other hand, wants to delay the integration by 10 years. RSF started deploying members around the country and in Khartoum without the army's permission. On April 15, the RSF and Sudanese army members engaged in gunfights in the capital. Both leaders want to keep the power. Some experts have stated that the battle is actually between two men who are desperate not to be ejected from the corridors of power after the country transitions to a full-fledged democracy. Currently, the country is in deep turmoil. According to the UN, people are running out of food, fuel and other vital supplies, and the healthcare system is in danger of collapse. Some world leaders are trying to establish peace. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Turkish Foreign Minister Mavlut Cavusoglu has told the media that negotiations are on with the two parties in a bid to reach an ultimate ceasefire. That is all for today. For more news, views, and analysis, please log on to business-standard.com. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.